Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, President Biden's new nominee for the Supreme Court to replace the outgoing judge Stephen Breyer. Not really going to change too much in way of the balance of power on the Supreme Court, but we are going to have a new face on the court. And it turns out she is a black woman. So Joe Biden fulfilled that campaign promise. You can see from their announcement uh, that historic nominee is there and her name is Ketanji Brown Jackson on February 25th. Joe Biden announced that, made this whole thing about uh, race for some weird reason, like they always do. But we're going to learn a little bit more about her. The background comes from Wikipedia, says that she was in office at the D.C. District of Columbia Court from a March 2013 to 2021, so was appointed by Obama at the lower level court, and then went up to the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. So she's been in the D.C. Circuit. We're going to spend a little bit of time on that, appointed by Joe Biden, right? So sort of the lower level appointment from Obama, the higher level up to the Court of Appeals by Biden very recently, right, in 2021, and then now going all the way up to the Supreme Court. So kind of working your way, tearing your way up and doing it relatively quickly. So from 2013 at the lower level court all the way to 2021 Supreme Court. Pretty quick ascension. Here is Joe Biden making the announcement. Of course, he walks out with Kamala because she's everywhere. And he's going to give us a quick announcement and then we're going to hear from Kitanji. Today, uh, as we watch freedom and liberty under attack abroad, your fault. I'm here to fulfill my responsibilities under the Constitution to preserve freedom and liberty okay. here in the United States of America. And it's my honor to introduce to the country a daughter of former public school teachers, a proven consensus builder, an accomplished lawyer, a distinguished jurist, one of the nation's most on one of the nation's most prestigious courts. My nominee for the United States Supreme Court is Judge Katanji Jackson. For too long, our government, our courts, haven't looked like America. And I believe it's time that we have a court that reflects the full talents and greatness of our nation with a nominee of extraordinary qualifications. She strives to be fair, to get it right, to do justice. That's something all of us should remember. Kamala shaking something her head. I've thought yeah. about throughout this process. As a matter of fact, I thought about it walking over here with her. One good. floor below, That's good. <laughs> we have several displays celebrating Black History Month. One of them includes the judicial oath of office taken and signed by Justice Thurgood Marshall himself. All right, so he's really An struggling oath. here. Let's listen to the judge. Let's listen to Ms. Katanji Brown. The podium is yours. All right. All right, so let's hear from the nominee. I am truly humbled by the extraordinary honor of this nomination. And I am especially grateful for the care that you have taken in discharging your constitutional duty in service of our democracy with all that is going on in the world today. Justice Breyer, in particular, not only gave me the greatest job that any young lawyer could ever hope to have, but he also exemplified every day in every way that a Supreme Court justice can perform at the highest level of skill and integrity while also being guided by civility, grace, pragmatism, and generosity of spirit. Justice Breyer, the members of the Senate will decide if I fill your seat, Yeah. but please know that I could never fill your shoes oh that's nice that's nice so sort of paying a nice you know homage to her former boss and uh she's gonna be replacing his seat but will never replace his spirit beautiful and we go to the charts and we can see how miss brown sort of fits in with the rest of the panel up there on the supreme court you can see i've got the current panel there these are the nine existing judges and we like to look at the age on when they were sort of admitted to the supreme court and so you can see sort of right around age you know kind of 50 uh, Thomas, very young at age 40. And then we've got Kagan, who was appointed in her 60s. So a couple outliers there. But everybody else is appointed in their 50s. When we see Kitanji Brown, right, she's in her 50s. And so we'll see what that means. We see that the current panel 
as it exists right now is basically Harvard and Yale people. The only person who did not go to Harvard or Yale is Amy Coney Barrett. Amy Coney Barrett is uh, the, you know, the oddball here. Everybody else went to Harvard or Yale. Miss Brown Jackson, of course, also went to Harvard. So she fits right in on that. Uh, a lot of Harvard. That would make it, it would be one, two, three, four Harvards, four Yales, and then one Notre Dame. Now, we also see... We have a lot of D.C. Circuit people here on the bench. We've got Roberts out of the D.C. Circuit. We've got Thomas out of the D.C. Circuit. Kavanaugh came up from D.C. And Breyer came up from the First Circuit. So now that Breyer's going to be gone, we can get rid of that First Circuit sort of appearance. And we have another D.C. Circuit. So we're adding another Harvard person. And we're adding another D.C. Circuit person. This is sort of what it looks like in the numbers. This is the age. And so we can see Kitanji is here. And uh, this is her age right at about 50. And so sort of, you know, kind of right there in the meat. Uh, we've got Kagan's going to be here. And then we had Thomas, who was here a little bit younger when he got appointed. So nothing really abnormal there. We see law schools aren't going to change. Uh, Breyer went to Harvard. And we have Kitanji also went to Harvard. So the makeup's not going to change there. Right, we're going to see the sort of the same split. Notre Dame was where we had Amy Coney Barrett, Yale four, Harvard four. So that's all going to stay the same. We do see that the court background is going to change a little bit right here. This is the current makeup. This is what it looks like. We only have three people from the D.C. Circuit, but we also have representation from the First Circuit. That is going away. First Circuit is now dead. And so we have four people who are all coming out of the D.C. Circuit. So it's sort of more, you know, some people make a big deal about this. Um and think it's consequential. I sort of find myself in that camp. You know, I think that we start to see that there's kind of a consolidation of power. You know, you have a bunch of judges in the D.C. Circuit who are sort of, you know, on the bench from the D.C. Circuit, still living there in the D.C. silo, whereas where Breyer was coming from was from Circuit 1, and so that, in, you know, encompasses Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, and so they're kind of out in favor of another D.C. Circuit judge. We can see that, you know, there's just not like, for example, there's no Ninth Circuit judge on the Supreme Court. There just isn't, right? The only real other circuit that we'll see is sort of the 10th with Gorsuch. And we'll take a look at that. Here uh, is how that will go. So D.C. Circuit now is being represented by uh, three different people. Uh, currently, we have the First Circuit being represented by Breyer. That changes. Now we're going to go up to four with Katanji. Jackson Brown, the first circuit is now gone. So the only other circuits you've got third, 10th, 7th, 2nd, and then Solicitor General, which was what Kagan was. And so, you know, you, you start to kind of, you know, kind of ask, your, why, why are they all Harvard and Yale people? You know, why are they all Washington, D.C. people? OK, well, there is good news when it comes to Judge Katanji Brown, at least from my perspective. I see a lot of myself in her and I've always wanted somebody who I could identify with on the Supreme Court because she's a criminal defense lawyer. Did you think this was about race? No, she's a criminal defense lawyer, just like me. She's on the Supreme Court, which I can appreciate. Here, in fact, is what she said during a prior confirmation hearing. And look, these individuals are highly, highly intelligent, highly polished. They basically are running for the Supreme Court their entire lives. And so they have these stories, which are very beautiful and very well scripted. But let's not lose sight of that, right? These are people who are auditioning for the highest court in the land for lifetime tenure. They hire consultants, counseling. Uh, they are very, very polished individuals. Doesn't take away, the, I'm sure the story is true and it's a beautiful story, but let's keep our skeptical eye on. Mostly talking to myself as a criminal defense lawyer. All right, Rob, you know, quit simping for another fellow criminal defense attorney out there. But here, let's listen to her. It is a good story and I think it is on point. Um, I had the privilege of serving as a federal public defender, assistant federal public defender in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think it was some 16 years ago. And as part of that experience, uh, I, as you say, represented people. I represented them uh, in the appellate division of my office. So all of my clients were convicted. And Already found guilty. I think that the insights um, that one gains from that kind of professional experience really can be very helpful in future endeavors, especially if you go into the jud judicial uh, service, as I have. Um, and, and I can give you a concrete example. Yes, um, tell us. When I 
worked with my clients as a defender. My job was to talk with them and to uh, try to get their help to identify errors, things that had gone wrong in their trial proceedings so that I could raise them on appeal. And one of the things that I noticed that I was really struck by was how little they could help me with that project. Um, most of my clients didn't really understand yep. what had happened to them. They'd just been through the most consequential proceeding in their lives, and no one really explained to them what they were supposed to expect. So this they didn't true. know where things might have gone wrong. And I remember that experience from, from all those years ago when I became a trial judge. One of the things that I do now is I take extra care to communicate with the defendants who come before me in the courtroom. I um, speak to them directly and not just to their lawyers. I use their names. Uh, I explain every stage of the proceeding because I want them to know what's going on. And when, when I have to sentence someone, and I've sentenced more than 100 people uh, at, uh, to date, I always tell them, I explain to them, this is why your behavior was so harmful to society that Congress thought that it had to be made a crime. And I say, that this is why I, as the judge, believe that you have to serve these consequences for your decision to, to engage in criminal behavior. And I think that's really important for our entire justice system because it's only if people understand what they've done, why it's wrong, and what will happen to them if they do it again that they can really start to rehabilitate. So there is a direct line from my, my defender service to what I do on the bench, and I think it's, it's beneficial. Yeah, she's right about that, and that is very good judicial behavior, right? When I see a judge who actually does spend time with people, I am very appreciative of that, because even though here, my, my personal experience representing people my law firm's experience representing people, we like to make sure that you know our, our three values are safety, clarity, and hope. We want to provide those to everybody that we work with. A lot of other attorneys, a lot of other judges, a lot of other, in particular, prosecutors don't treat anybody coming through the criminal justice system in that way. In fact, the system, in my opinion, is largely built to just process people through, like case numbers and like you know bodies, you know numbers and criminal charges, and that's it. Just sort of put them through the meat grinder and spit them out the other end. And what do we want in a society? Do we want a society that just punishes people so they come out worse out the other end or maybe we should focus on you know rehabilitation rather than retribution so that people are actually improved after they come out of the justice system otherwise we're going to continue in this cycle indefinitely and i can tell you from my personal experience 99.9% .9 of the people that we've ever worked with here at my law firm are very good people, very good people. They just screwed up. It's a very small sliver of people who actually are, you know, sort of in that latter category. And so what Ms. Brown is talking about is very relevant. It's very pertinent. And I think that is something that we need more of in our justice system. That was a softball question that she got. Of course, she had all of the time in the world to sort of expound upon that idea. And I think it's very relevant and very, very Good. We sort of want that. Now, there is this sort of uh, opposition to criminal justice reform that I've experienced largely on the side of Republicans and on conservatives. You know, conservatives uh, up until very recently, until our government became dictatorial, largely were sort of, you know, pro police and pro in favor of law enforcement and sort of, you know, giving government all the tools in the world that they needed to go do their job. Well, when the government turned those tools against its people and started going into people's gymnasiums and citing them for having their business open, people started to have a little bit more skeptical uh, sort of ideas about law enforcement. And quite frankly, folks, the conservatives up until recently on the Supreme Court were terrible on civil liberties and, and individual rights. You know, they didn't have a a, a warrant that they ever threw out because they thought that the police just kind of did everything reasonably. Here, if we can see that pendulum swing back a little bit, we can protect people in their homes, protect people in their cars, stop law enforcement from you know, violating people's rights and freedoms in order to make a conviction. What Ms. Brown is talking about is much more the latter about rehabilitation and supporting people as they're going through the justice system. Very positive. Here is a more difficult question that she got from Ms. Blackburn, of course, another senator. This was back during the confirmation hearings 
for Miss Kintanji Brown. And uh, she's being asked now about packing the court. And we're going to hear a lot of this type of answers from Miss Jackson. So she is going to be telling us, uh, well, you know, it's really inappropriate for me to comment on these things. And we're going to hear that at length for the foreseeable future. So, first of all, do you believe that deliberately expanding the court to allow one president to pack it with their nominees would undermine confidence in our laws and undermine the separation of powers? And then secondly, if they were to expand the court, if President Biden did that, uh, would you accept a Supreme Court nomination under those circumstances? All right, tough question. Let's listen. I am currently a sitting judge in the lower courts, and as such, I'm bound uh, by Supreme Court precedent and by Supreme Court rulings. And I don't think that it's appropriate for me to comment on proposals about the structure of the court, about um, uh, expanding the court, or, or anything of the sort, just as it wouldn't be appropriate for me to talk about Ugh or critique or comment on um, Supreme Court precedent. So I'm, I'm unable to, to okay. answer that but question. But you are answer. aware that groups that are advocating for you support that? Senator, you there, are, there are lots of people who um, have expressed their All support right. for me and I'm gratified, but I'm really focused on this nomination and uh, I am, hoping uh, to uh, be confirmed to the D.C. Circuit. Okay. And she was confirmed, and that was not too long ago. That was just in 2021, and so the question was relevant right now. She is going to be going up, or at least nominated, to go up to the Supreme Court. She did get confirmed at the lower level, and so all of the Republicans who voted for her on the lower level are going to have to sort of justify uh, an about-face if they don't confirm her again, she seems like she sort of fits the bill. She hits Joe Biden's campaign criteria. He wanted a black female and he picked a black female. He also wanted somebody who was going to get you know, passed. And I think she sort of fits the rest of the criteria that the Washington establishment likes to see. Harvard grad, somebody who's young, right, age 50, means she's going to be on the Supreme Court for a long time, came up from the D.C. Circuit. Might be a shoe in We'll see. She is a criminal defense attorney. I do like that. We'll see how some of her other issues uh, reveal themselves as she is questioned during the Senate Judiciary Confirmation hearings. But there's one other thing to take into consideration, and this might make or break the case for many of you. It's her watch. What kind of watch do you think she wears? Go ahead. Take a guess. Here it is. It's an Apple watch. Ugh. So now we have to sort of compare and contrast. Criminal defense attorney. Good. Apple Watch, not so good. We'll see. Let me know what you think about Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. She is going to be up for a big slew of questions in front of the Senate very, very soon. I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. Let me know down in the comments below. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We do a live show weekdays, and I would love to see you there because I always look forward to seeing you on the next one.